Thank you so much. Um, so, um, first of all, thank you for having me here, and thank you, Dr. Collins, for, in, for inviting me as well. Um, I put together two cases, two clinical cases um, that are that are very informal, but they they sort of highlight the role of interventional pulmonologists in in the management of some of the complex uh, patients that that we see um, as pulmonologists. And uh, so again, please interrupt any time if you have questions. Raise your hand. Um, uh, the first case is a is a gentleman, uh, 46 years old, who presented with dyspnea and some hemoptysis, and on a chest X-ray had a right hilar mass and probably collapse of the lower lobe. Uh, and on a CT was found to have um, a large endobronchial lesion in the right bronchus, in the right main stem bronchus. And um, uh, this actually illustrates an interesting point, and this is an example of how air uh, will really, you know, get in even if you have a near complete obstruction of the bronchus. So, looking at an X-ray, the lung is fairly aerated, but uh, and so you, you you may underestimate the amount of obstruction. And he had an endobronchial lesion, which was uh, completely obstructing the right bronchus. And so, I just wanted to highlight some of the things about central airway obstruction because I feel that this is a diagnosis that is very often um, delayed or missed. Um, and that is um, not because the doctors are not paying attention, it's mainly because the symptoms are very nonspecific. Um, and, and, um, and so patients may come in with, with some, of, some cough, uh, they may get treated for COPD exacerbation, which is a much more common condition. Um, and really an imaging and, and a CT scan uh, followed by a bronchoscopy is, is necessary to make a diagnosis quickly. So as, uh, as uh, interventional pulmonologists, we are uh, faced with the task of not only making a diagnosis for this patient, but also uh, of, uh, of relieving the obstruction and palliating symptoms. And so there are uh, really two categories of, um, um, of, of therapies that are available. Uh, the immediate therapies are, are used to uh, restore patency. Um, um, at the time of the procedure, um, and some of the delayed therapies are, are you know, t may take weeks to take effect. Uh, they are they are completely complementary to each other, and as you'll see in this case, um, uh, this patient was treated with a multimodality treatment. So, in, the, in this talk, we'll talk about some of the mechanical treatments, uh, thermal uh, ablation, um, cryo debridement, and stenting. So, you know, a rigid bronchoscope or rigid bronchoscopy is. Um, uh, probably the, the most important tool uh, that an interventional pulmonologist has at his disposal. Um, a, a rigid bronchoscope is essentially a metallic tube that uh, has ventilating ports on the side. Um, a, a tracheoscope does not, it, it's a tra tracheoscope is shorter um, without the ventilating uh, holes on the side. And this really allows you to um, take bigger pieces of biopsy, control bleeding, um, and really protect the airway much better than a flexible bronchoscope that we are very much familiar with. So um, it's important to realize that there are really three types of lesions um, uh, that we may be faced with, and the treatment of these lesions is very different. Uh, there is an endobronchial uh, lesion up here. You may have a a completely extrinsic compression, or the most common type of a lesion is a mixed lesion, where you do have a component that's in the bronchial and a component that's extrinsic. And the reason why this is important is because when we use ablative therapies or hot therapies, we, we want to make sure that we're dealing with a pure endobronchial lesion. We, we don't want to start burning uh, a lesion that looks like this, that's extrinsically compressed. And, um, you know, there's really no um, uh, clear advantages of one treatment or one modality versus another. It, it a lot depends on your your comfort level or whatever is available in your institution. But um, uh, electrocautery is probably the most widely available, uh, mainly because the the generator is already available in every single hospital, since surgeons use um, the cautery generator for for regular surgery. Um, Argon plasma coagulation is widely available from our GI colleagues. They use this all the time for uh, during colonoscopies and EGDs. And then laser is uh, the most expensive of the modalities, um, and um, and it has um, uh, also the, the the deepest penetration. So you you really have to be very careful when losing, using laser not to cause any perforations. 
Um, and again, as I, as I uh, explained, and, um, it, 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 you, you want to be dealing with an endobronchial lesion uh, if you're going to use a hot therapy. And uh, also very important is to make sure that there's distal airway um, past the level of obstruction. In other words, if, if the tumor goes all the way down um, and, and there's no viable lung, then there's really no sense in, in trying to open up an airway. And that is actually very... Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to determine, um, and, and many pulmonologists look, look at a CAT scan and they, and they, and they appreciate atelectasis, and uh, they mistakenly assume that the lung is, is, is gone and there's nothing to do. Um, in reality, a CAT scan cannot differentiate between blood, uh, pus, um, or, or tumor. Right? So, so that really requires a bronchoscopic evaluation, and so... Um, uh, now, uh, as far as the, 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 um, the duration of collapse or duration of atelectasis, obviously you want to get to these patients as soon as possible. Um, there's no real absolute cutoff, um, even though on the slide it says four weeks, but in reality um, we, we uh, sometimes do open up airway that's been blocked for a few months. Uh, you do need to realize that sometimes you do get a VQ mismatch and the patient will get more hypoxemic and sometimes they do require, um, uh, uh, you know, intubation for 24, 48 hours after the procedure until the VQ uh, matches. Um, with every therapy there are risks and with the hot therapy uh, we always worry about airway fire. So basically a spark that's created in an oxygen rich environment. Uh, airway fire is a entirely preventable complication, and if it happens, it's, it's, it's because an operator and an anesthesiologist were not speaking to each other. So uh, we, you have to drop the oxygen to less than 40%. You need to remove anything flammable from the airway, and, and what is the most flammable object in the airway during the procedure? It's an endotracheal tube. It's a plastic ET tube, right? So, so uh, uh, many, uh, many people, including myself, uh, do all of these procedures under rigid, uh, mainly because you don't have anything flammable. If you, if you do um, use hot therapy with an endotracheal tube, you have to make sure it's about four centimeters away from the tip of the probe. Um, and then um, if a patient has a pacemaker, then that, the patient needs a magnet to deactivate a pacemaker or ACD. So switching gears and talking about the cold therapy, which is also uh, a very important tool that's available. Um, a cryotherapy is a probe that, that gets cooled uh, with nitrous oxide gas to about negative 79, negative 80 degrees Celsius. By the virtue of, of uh, extreme cold, you, you create cell damage. Um, and uh, you also cause some vasoconstriction, so when you, when you do take a biopsy, there's less bleeding. It's just a quick illustration of, of cryotherapy. Um, the probe uh, touches the, the tissue that, that you want to remove. You press the pedal, and it sticks to the tissue, and the whole thing comes out. So again, you have to take the bronchoscope out together with the probe. Now, uh, in, a, in an animal model, you can see that uh, uh, when you use cryotherapy, you create a very predictable kill zone because uh, you, you actually gain about 10 degrees Celsius for every millimeter away from the epicenter. So the, the very epicenter is gonna have a hemorrhage and necrosis, and then when you, as you start moving out to the periphery, you, you get the normal lung. And, um, and, and again, this is, this is very, very helpful. Now, uh, some of the applications of cryo, uh, number one, uh, you can use, on the left side of the screen, you can use cryo uh, to destroy granulation tissue that usually gets formed at the end of the stem. Um, now, uh, again, you, can't, you, you should not use a hot therapy, right, because stents are all flammable. Um, uh, I use cryotherapy a lot for tumor debulking, and as you can see here, um, the, the amount of tissue that you can get is, is phenomenal compared to a transbronchial biopsy. Um, and also there's complete preservation of architecture, right? Because when it unfolds, um, you, you don't destroy the architecture as opposed to a hot therapy when you burn something, then the architecture is gone. So a uh, few things about stents. Uh, again, these are complementary modalities. Uh, stents we can insert into large airways, although now uh, some companies make smaller stents that can go into low bronchite. Um, there's different types of stents out in the market. 
um, uh, the, the two main categories of stents are metallic and silicone, uh, and the metallics come uh, as uncovered, uh, uh, partially covered, or fully covered. Um, different companies make different types of stents, and each one has its own advantages and disadvantages, but uh, you know, as a brief overview, uh, the uncovered stent uh, will not migrate because, because the, 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 the struts will dig into the submucosa, and um, because it will not migrate, it is also very difficult to remove, right? So each advantage has its own counterpart. And so because it's very difficult to remove, there's an FDA black box warning as of 2005 that you should not use metallic stents in benign disease, which means tracheal stenosis, airway compression from goiters, uh, tracheomalacia. Um, uh, again, because it's very difficult to remove. Now, the, the covered stents or, or the silicone stents are uh, very easy to remove, um, but therefore they also are prone to migration. Uh, also, silicone uh, tends to mucus plug, so if a patient receives a silicone stent, uh, we, we usually put them on a pretty uh, complex regimen of uh, mucolytics and expectorants. Um, and then um, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, hybrid stents or the metallic stents that are fully covered um, sort of take the best of both properties. Uh, silicone stents can only be deployed with a rigid bronchoscope. The, the metallic stents can be deployed either with a flexible or a rigid. Uh, again, depends on uh, institution's availability. And uh, so just a couple of examples. Uh, this is a uncovered stent, as you can see, um, that um, was put in for an endobronchial lesion. So probably not the best uh, type of a stent to put in for an endobronchial lesion as and essentially a few days later, uh, the, the tumor completely grew uh, into the stent and caused obstruction of the stent. So the stent was removed. You could even see little, uh, little marks from the, from the stent, and then the tumor itself was uh, taken out very easily with a, with a single cryo uh, probe, and then the patient received a fully covered stent. Um, so uh, talking about our gentleman who came in with uh, uh, obstruction of the right bronchus. Um, we inserted a rigid bronchoscope, uh, took a few biopsies using rigid forceps. Uh, at that point, uh, we wanted to establish patency. You know, we wanted to make sure that there is a, a viable lung distal to the tumor. So, in order to create a track, uh, insert a, a serious effigial balloon uh, that we inflate uh, and essentially. Um, can they use that to, to uh, make, uh, create a lumen or where the lumen would be? And um, essentially here, we can also use the, the, the bevel of the rigid scope to pour out the tumor. Um, you can see that uh, working with the rigid, I'm able to uh, have good visualization. I'm able to have a, a suction, a separate instrument, uh, and, and a, a large biopsy forceps. And, and here, um, a, a silicone stent was deployed. As you can see, it's a little bit, it's a little bit distal to the, to the obstruction. Sometimes pulling it back is difficult, so there's a little maneuver where you, you sort of turn a um, couple of times, and then you pull the stand back, and then you release it, and it opens up again, and that's your right bronchus right there. That's nice to stand it. So this patient had metastatic disease, uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma. He was treated with uh, uh, gemcitabine carboplatin, uh, also received thoracic radiation, uh, palliative radiation with 30 gray in 10 fractions. You could see here that uh, there's significant decrease in the, in the size of the right hyalur mass. Uh, this is the silicone stent right here. 
and uh, two months later, uh, the stent was removed, our patient was doing well, uh, he was conti continued on chemotherapy. Um, in March, which is the month after that, um, there was clearly progression of disease um, with some, more, some tumor recurrence in the right bronchus. Um, the patient was started on a PD-L1 inhibitor, um, um, but uh, we uh, did not hear about the patient at the time um, from the oncologist. Um, and a month after that, the patient came into the MICU with respiratory failure, intubated, and had a wide out of the right lung. And, and again, this uh, highlights a very important point, um, and I'm not sure if there's any oncologists in the room, but uh, this is something that uh, very often will get overlooked uh, by, by, by physicians, um, and, and uh, the fact that the lung is aerated it gives you a false sense of security, uh, but you could see that you lose the, 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 the 5 or 10% patency that you had before, or maybe mucus gets stuck there, and now the patient is, is in respiratory failure. So, hopefully this works. <clears throat> so, image is a little distorted, but basically you see here complete obstruction of the right and maybe 90% obstruction of the left. And, and again, you see that? So that's what he was breathing with. Um, and so again, this is a very, you know, very difficult problem for, for, uh, for anyone um, uh, because you now have to um, uh, you know, restore the, the, the patency of the airway and try to get the guy extubated. Must be a PowerPoint thing because it's, So we were able to open up the obstruction, put, a, put in a silicone Y stent, that's the left side, and the, the Y stent really looks like a letter Y, and the right leg of the Y stent, I telescoped it into a silicone bronchial stent, and that's the little junction that you see there, so basically it's, it's stent within stent. And the right side, as you could see, you know, has, a lot of disease, but there's probably some opening in the lower lobes, in the right lower lobe. So this allowed the patient to get extubated. Um, this is his pre and post film, and so you could see there's some patency now in the in the uh, in the right lower lobe, uh, but uh, clearly there's there's a lot of disease. So uh, at this point, the, the patient was still intubated, and what we ended up doing is. Uh, giving him a few cycles of brachytherapy, which is basically a, an endobronchial catheter that gets put in and the radiation oncologist loads seeds and gives a very high, but a very focal uh, uh, delivery of radiation therapy endobronchially. And so just to just to give you an idea, so this is going down the endotracheal tube uh, this is the cat, the white is the catheter. We, we put it, you know, kind of through the stent and we direct it into the right lower lobe. The catheter uh, itself is very, very thin and it can easily slip out. So actually the hardest part about the procedure is, is taping this catheter to the ET tube so that it doesn't fall out uh, during transport. And then the patient gets transported to a radiation department. Um, there's a little stylet inside the, the, the catheter. You can remove the stylet. This is actually the stent. You can see the stent here, and the little dot is um, the little dot corresponds to the tip of the brachytherapy catheter. And then uh, the radiation oncologist can uh, deliver radiation anywhere along the catheter. So uh, he makes a simulation model, and and it can be and he can treat the patient anywhere along the catheter. And this is after first and uh, first two cycles of brachytherapy. You can see how nicely the the right lung is opening up. Um, eventually, after two cycles of brachytherapy, we wanted to treat the right middle lobe. Remember the, the stent, initially the stent kind of jailed uh, all of the lobes, uh, uh, and so at this point we were able to remove the, the Y stent 
and insert uh, an, an uncovered stent so that we can now put the catheter through the uncovered stent into the right middle lobe and deliver more radiation therapy. Um, so, so this is, uh, again, this is a, a, a Y stent that we saw earlier, uh, but now it is connected to an, an uncovered metallic stent and the middle lobe is right there and that's the lower lobe. And you can see that it looks a lot better than it did when we first put the stent in. So a uh, patient got discharged. He was very comfortable not having any dyspnea. Uh, his CAT scan a month later did show some tumor ingrowth into the left bronchial stent. And sure enough, he had a tumor. This may also be granulation tissue. Sometimes it's hard to tell, but it ended up being tumor. The tumor was sort of blocking the, the tip of the left bronchus, uh, left bronchial stent. Uh, this is, it was a very good case for cryotherapy. We took out this tumor, um, opened up the distal end, and put in a small, partially covered metallic stent into the, into the Y stent uh, to make sure the tumor doesn't grow back. And you can see that the upper and lower, left lower lobes are open. Patient went home, went to hospice, and um, he obviously passed away, but he was not short of breath. Um, so um, I wanna, just for the sake of time, I wanna uh, move on to the second case. Um, and, uh, uh, and the second case is, um, talks about another, you know, a different aspect of interventional pulmonary, but also uh, something that we very often see. It's a case of a 40-year-old woman with severe persistent asthma. Um, she was obese, uh, probably from steroids. Uh, she had also uh, some, uh, let's say yes, she had some psych issues, um, um, and, um, um, and, and she's had a diagnosis of asthma ever since she was a child, and no one was able to get her off of steroids. So she was referred to our institution for bronchial thermoplasty, um, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but I just wanted to show you her, uh, her initial PFTs um, and basically her FEV1 was 35% predicted. Her residual volume down here was 172% predicted. Okay, so severe airflow obstruction. Um, so a few, few slides on bronchial thermoplasty. Um, if, if, if you haven't heard about it, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly new uh, uh, FDA-approved treatment for, for severe persistent asthma in patients over the age of 18. Uh, it, it involves delivery of thermal energy uh, bronchoscopically um, to decrease the thickness of airway smooth muscle. It is actually now recognized by GINA, uh, the Global Initiator for Asthma, as uh, a valid um, uh, uh, option, treatment option for patients with severe asthma. Um, and uh, in, uh, you know, again, in animal models, uh, we see that uh, airway smooth muscle thickness decreases. However, as you could see, even in this cartoon, the airway lumen does not change, right? So what does that mean? That means that the FEV1 may not necessarily get better, right? So, uh, but the airway smooth muscle thickness decreased and that has been shown to translate into clinical effect, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Uh, again, uh, the trichome stain over here shows that airway smooth muscle is, the, is uh, much smaller after treatment. This is a canine model. And then another cool example, um, th these are two airways. The left one was treated with, with a bronchial thermoplasty. Um, uh, the right one uh, was not treated. And then um, uh, methacholine was instilled into each of the airways. And as you can see that the untreated airway got, got bronchospastic and the treated airway remained open. So it's kind of an interesting proof of concept. So uh, bronchial thermoplasty is, perfor is, is, is conducted uh, using uh, a, a catheter. Um, this catheter fits through a 2.0 millimeter working channel, so a diagnostic bronchoscope is used. Uh, the catheter is attached to a generator that uh, delivers um, uh, heat. Um, you you um, uh, basically heat up the airway to about uh, 60 degrees Celsius. And um, after 10 seconds of, uh, of uh, heat delivery, the generator automatically cuts off. So you, you cannot overheat the airway. So the procedure is performed in three separate sessions. Um, you treat the, uh, the uh, right lower lobe, then left lower lobe, and then upper lobes bilaterally. Uh, the right middle lobe is excluded from treatment. And um, this is just uh, an example 
of, uh, of how it looks. So the catheter has these hash marks. Each black hash mark is five millimeters apart. So you, you go in uh, distally and then you start pulling back. Um, and there's no sound here, but basically um, you press the pedal, it delivers heat for 10 seconds and then it cuts off. And then you pull back one, one hash mark and you try to really cover as many airways as possible. It's a pretty tedious procedure. Um, there's actually one study, a small study, where patients were treated and they underwent transbronchial biopsies before and after treatment. And um, uh, it shows that uh, after treatment, the thickness of airway smooth muscle was smaller. And also, interestingly enough, um, the amount of airway smooth muscle in the right middle lobe, which is actually excluded from treatment, was also smaller. So that may uh, suggest that there's probably some dissipation of heat um, and um, you may be covering areas of the lung without uh, directly treating them. So in any case, um, uh, when, when we uh, receive a consult for bronchial thermoplasty, it, it really becomes a multidisciplinary approach. So asthma is not a pulmonary issue, right? Asthmatics are, 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 are should not only be seen by pulmonologists because asthma is a very complex heterogeneous condition. Um, and as I'll show you in this case, um, it may be a manifestation of something completely different. So every single patient who gets referred for bronchial thermoplasty gets a formal uh, laryngoscopic evaluation uh, for vocal cord dysfunction, for upper airway disease, sinus conditions. I actually work with a, with a laryngologist who is an allergist. He's, he's a medicine, medical uh, guy by training. He's not an ENT. Uh, I personally find that better uh, because you, you really get a, uh, you get sort of um, get a, um, a, a much more comprehensive approach. Um, uh, now, uh, I'll skip over this. So here's an example of a 23-year-old woman that was referred for severe asthma management, referred for bronchial thermoplasty. Um, and um, during her nasopharyngoscopy, she was found to have a very large um, hyperplastic adenoid. Uh, the adenoid was uh, essentially uh, dripping mucus onto her larynx. Um, therefore, she was coughing. Therefore, she was having uh, post-nasal drip. And there was, there's no wonder that she was having asthma. And again, that is uh, the problem is in the nose, not in the airways. Uh, once we fix her uh, upper airway, her asthma went away. Oh, it, it got significantly better. So going back to our patient, our patient was screened for tracheobronchomalacia. So that's another uh, um, uh, mimicker of, of asthma. Um, uh, this is a CT uh, where a patient expires. Um, and while they are expiring or exhaling, uh, the scan is performed. And you could see that there's bowing of the posterior membrane. And there's also some ground glass suggesting air trapping. A bronchoscopy was performed and it confirmed the diagnosis of severe tracheobronchomalacia. So tracheobronchomalacia is a, is a very complex disorder and it is very, very much under-recognized and misdiagnosed because it, it, it presents with very nonspecific symptoms. Uh, these symptoms uh, may, are, are usually attributed to more common conditions such as asthma or COPD. Um, in terms of uh, flow volume loops, this has been looked at uh, by, by a group in Boston. It turns out that flow volume loops are not reliable for diagnosis of tracheomalacia. So don't use flow volume loops because they can be all over the place. Um, really, the diagnosis of tracheobronchomalacia is a, is a diagnosis that you first have to suspect on clinical grounds. Um, uh, then um, you move to uh, uh, radiology. Um, now, in terms of CAT scans, so very often patients or, or physicians order uh, a CT of the chest to look for tracheobronchomalacia. You'll probably, you'll probably miss a diagnosis about 90% of the time if you do it that way. Um, and expiratory scans uh, are, are better than, than regular scans. However, as you could see in this example, uh, the diagnosis was missed. And so, so you really want to do a dedicated dynamic expiratory scan. And this really requires um, a collaboration with the radiologist and, and even the technician because the way the scan is done is very similar to the way the PFTs are done. So you, you, have, you have someone who, who is basically coaching the patient to take a deep breath in and then, and then fully exhale and sort of keep pushing, keep pushing, and then the, radiolog and the, the, uh, the scan is made. So 
you know, really, um, uh, the, despite of all the workup, you really need to do a bronchoscopy on these patients. And the way the bronchoscopy is performed is, is under moderate sedation, and the patient has to be awake enough to be able to uh, follow commands, and they need to be able to inhale and then exhale. So if the patient coughs, then that doesn't count, right? Because everyone's posterior membrane will bulge during cough. It really needs to be a, a controlled expiratory maneuver. And then you, you sort of visually grade it, you know, very similar to the way the cardiologist looks at an echo and gives an EF. Um, so the comorbid conditions are, 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 they're not just comorbid conditions, they, they may be the drivers of tracheomalacia. And so um, usually tracheomalacia in an adult is going to be a manifestation of something, of, of some other comorbid condition, as opposed to uh, the way it is in children. So GERD is a very important uh, driver, so, so um, we, we absolutely have to evaluate for GERD, because if you don't treat GERD, um, you, even if you treat the Malaysia for component, you will not make the patient better. Asthma COPD goes without saying. Uh, some of these patients have an immunodeficiency, um, uh, like an immunoglobulin deficiency, which then predisposes them to recurrent infections, and the recurrent infections cause inflammation, which gives you the Malaysia, right? So it becomes a vicious cycle. Uh, many of these patients are obese, uh, probably because they get steroids for, for um, for the wrong diagnosis. Uh, sleep apnea is, is also very commonly seen. Um, Non-invasive ventilation is also treatment for Malaysia. And then vocal cord dysfunction is very interesting. Um, and it turns out that vocal cord dysfunction is present in close to 50% of trachea Malaysia patients. Um, not sure why, but, um, uh, but again, uh, vocal cord dysfunction will make them short of breath. So if you don't treat the VCD, um, um, you may not make the patient clinically better. So as far as the GERD, the way we approach GERD, every patient who is evaluated for trachea gets a Bravo study or a pH probe um, to get, a, to get a, an objective uh, a quantification of, of GERD. Um, and what a pH probe is, is basically um, a, a sensor that has, or a catheter that has two sensors. One sensor sits in the upper esophageal sphincter, one in the lower esophageal sphincter, and then you just see how often the acid hits the, 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 the sensors. So if the acid comes up to the upper esophageal sphincter, you know that probably the acid will spill over into the lung and cause the patient to, to, to cough and lead to malacia. And then you add up the scores and you get a Demeester score, um, and a Demeester score of more than 15 and indicates reflux. And as far as treatment for GERD, if a Demeester score is more than 50, which is severe GERD, then the patient undergoes Nissen fund application um, uh, as, as a complement to medical therapy. Why? Because if, if you don't fix the GERD and if it's severe GERD, um, then that patient will continue having trachea bronchomalacia. And basically, Nissen fund application is, is just a wraparound of, of the, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, around the fundus so that the reflux, so the acid doesn't reflux. A um, couple of uh, you know, couple of things on vocal cord dysfunction. So first of all, this requ really requires an experienced laryngologist, um, and I don't have sound here, but uh, vocal cord dysfunction is a um, is uh, often thought to be a, a, a neurological problem where there is a discrepancy uh, between uh, the brain and and the nerves going to the vocal cords, and very often the patient will in will the cords will open during. Uh, during exhalation and close during inhalation. Um, so uh, we, we, you know, we always treat uh, trachea bronchomalacia medically, uh, just sort of uh, addressing the underlying problems. Uh, Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is very important. Uh, it's not covered by insurance, unfortunately. So. Um, and then um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, uh, putting, you know, doing a stand trial and, and, and the surgical options. So it's, it's intuitive to, to um, uh, try to put in a stent to, to uh, stabilize the central airway. Um, and um, this has been uh, formally looked at, again, by a group in Boston in uh, 2007, um, where patients underwent central airway stabilization with silicone stents. Uh, or bronchial stents, depending on where the Malaysia was located. These patients were all found to have improvement in their, in their uh, quality of life questionnaires, 
whether it's in George questionnaire or uh, ATS or uh, Karnofsky performance scale. Again, this is not controlled. This is a small group, so don't try to sort of analyze it too much. But patients subjectively felt better. Their lung function did not improve. And that just means that FEV1 is not a, is not a very a accurate uh, uh, measure of outcome, right? Because uh, again, remember that airflow is mostly determined by periphery, right? That's where airflow resistance is. So when we measure FEV1, you're probably, you're probably getting a flavor of the of the small airways. Um, with tracheomalacia, the airflow obstruction may happen anywhere. It may happen in the central airway, or it may happen down down uh, more in the peripheral. So, uh, as you may imagine, these patients also had significant amount of complications from, from the stent, um, with, the, with the biggest complication being obstruction uh, during, during the first 30 days. And because of this, we, we now use, a very, like I mentioned before, we use um, a very strict regimen of inhalers and bronchodilators and mucolytics. We limit the amount of stent exposure to just one week, so we don't leave it in for a few months. Uh, because the question that you're trying to answer with a stent is, does the patient feel better, right? So if, if putting a stent makes them feel better, then you know that central airway stabilization plays an important role in their, in their symptoms, and then you can offer them a surgical, uh, a surgical option if they're surgical candidates. Um, so just a couple of videos. Hopefully this works. Oh. So uh, the, the, um, when, you, when you're putting in a stent, uh, you custom make it. Uh, you measure the, the size of the airway. You can cut the stent. Um, again, this is a silicone stent, so it's fully customizable. Um, here, making a hole for the right upper lobe, just basically with, uh, with a set of grandeurs, nothing, uh, nothing too fancy. Here we put, we're putting the stent into a, a special um, stent deployment um, uh, delivery mechanism. Here we are inserting the stent into the, uh, the, uh, the rigid um, delivery uh, catheter. So th this is actually the stent. It's all kind of crumbled in inside this uh, the delivery mechanism. And now and now we're able to deploy the stent, which is deploying blindly, right? It goes through the rigid bronchoscope. And you push the plunger, and the stent comes flying out. Looks pretty brutal first time you look at it. So it's blind. It's blind. Now my rigid, I know with so my rigid bronchoscope, the tip of the rigid bronchoscope is sitting at a position so where. It's stem or wherever. What was it? Wherever you want it to be. Actually, what? It's measured precisely. Exactly. Exactly. So in this case, this is a, this is a stent put in for tracheomalacia. So it's going to be a Y stent. So um, uh, it, uh, in this case, we deployed it in the trachea. Um, I know the length of the trachea limb. Let's say it's two centimeters. So I park my rigid probably about maybe two and a half to three centimeters <clears throat> um, uh, proximal to the main carina. And then when I deploy the stent, it'll open up, and theoretically, it should sit right on top of the main carina. Now. Uh, You know, it's not, it doesn't always go. So these videos are, just one second. So again, in this example, the stent needs to be adjusted. And that is very often the case. You deploy it and it's kind of crumbled or it's not exactly sitting where it should be. And so at this point you have to, as you can see, you have to adjust it. Here's another example. This, this is the right upper lobe opening. So you can 
In other words, to get it in position, you can grab it. You see, this is in the trachea. You really maneuver the stent, and you and you can get it fixed in position. So it almost always requires some adjustment. And this is sort of the final result. You can see that the upper lobe opening is right there, perfectly aligned. Okay, so if you're putting this in for malignant obstruction, where the airway uh, is distorted, um, it is much more difficult. Uh, putting, a, putting, uh, putting in a Y into tracheomalacia patients is one of the easiest types of patients to put it in because the airway is widely open and it's because it's a dynamic compression. Uh, for malignant obstruction, sometimes you, you, you have to spend, uh, you know, five minutes or ten minutes adjusting the stent and, and obviously without compromising ventilation. So it's one of those things where you deploy it and then you have to work really quickly. And if the patient starts to desaturate, you just have to take it out. Incidentally, when you remove the silicone stent, um, it, you cannot remove it through the rigid. You have to actually have to take the rigid out with it. So then the patient can either get reintubated by anesthesia or you just back mask ventilate until you put the rigid back in. Um, a couple of slides on tracheobronchoplasty. So this is a surgical uh, fix for tracheomalacia, and uh, this is a big deal operation. It's a, it's a large thoracotomy, and the surgeon basically uh, sews in a uh, mesh um, and puts the mesh onto the posterior membrane to, to placate either the trachea or the bronchi, depending on what the malacia is. Uh, very tedious operation, could be up to six hours. Um, and, um, and so for this reason, we, we, we're very, very careful about uh, patient selection, uh, because we really want to make sure that the patient will benefit from the surgery. A uh, couple of... Uh, um, just to finish up, a couple of special scenarios that we sometimes deal with. Uh, patients who have a focal malacia at the level of the cervical trachea, um, as you could see here, uh, may benefit from a silicone stent. The problem is that the silicone stent will fly distally uh, uh, because the risk of migration is quite high if, you, if you're going to stand below the cricoid. So there's a, there's a technique which is called external fixation of a silicone stent. Um, I'll show you a case that I did recently. Here's a patient. <coughs> this, is, this, is a, this is a patient who actually had tracheal stenosis, but the idea is the same. Um, we needed to put a small stent right below the cricoid. So, so silicone stent is deployed with a rigid bronchoscope. As you can imagine, this is how it looks most of the time when it's deployed. Um, you have to um, maneuver it a little. You uh, can balloon dilate the stent. It'll open up very nicely. These are the cords, by the way. These are the vocal folds. So my rigid is actually supraglottic. So, right, so you could do supraglottic jet ventilation uh, while you're working. Um, this is the um, this is the stent after it's been put in position, and again the problem is that the stent will probably migrate. So the technique that uh, that can be used is that um, you can insert two 16 gauge uh, angiocatheters, um, the same way as you would do a percutaneous tracheostomy. So these are these are the, the two 16 gauge angiocatheters. Then you you thread a a string, a nylon suture through. You take you you take two nylon sutures. You put one nylon suture through the distal uh, angiocath, and you put a loop. Uh, you make a loop from the second nylon suture, put it through the proximal, and then you can you you thread the the distal through the proximal. As you can see here, you make you you put it through the loop. Then you pull the loop up. So you grab again. You grab the you grab the the string that's coming from the distal with rigid forceps. Then you pull up on the loop, and now your your now your string looks like that, right? Now the the, the string is through the stand and through the through the skin. Here here's the string holding the stand in place. You put you put in a button, and you put in a bunch of knots. And now the stent is externally fixated using this small button. 
So going back to our patient, this, the, this is again, as a reminder, this is a woman with severe asthma who had severe trachomalacia. We put in a silicone Y stent. We, again, these are the PFTs that I showed you earlier. Just as a reminder, FEV1 was 35% and her residual volume was 172. These are her PFTs immediately after the procedure. Her FEV1 is 66%, so double, and her residual volume went down to 85% from 172. And I can tell you that clinically, she had a remarkable response, remarkable. Um, and she was able to walk, and it, it, was, just, it, was, it was incredible. Um, now, obviously, as, you, as I showed you earlier, that you cannot leave a stent for too long because they'll start getting the mucus obstruction. Uh, so we took the stent out a week later, and she went on to uh, receive uh, tra tracheobronchoplasty, which was successful. Um, during the one-year follow-up, she was doing well. Uh, still on, on all of her asthma medications, but off of prednisone, and she did not visit an ER in one year. And needless to say, she never required bronchial thermoplasty. Okay, so thank you very much. How long is the duration of treatment on an average? For trachea bronchoplasty? You mean after the operation? or? Yeah, well, I mean, so far we've, we've been, you know, we've followed her for about two years, uh, and, and she's doing well. Now, after tracheobronchoplasty, you know, we follow these patients very, very rigorously, um, and, and again, you know, looking at past experience, you know, you always learn from, 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 from your, from your uh, mistakes. So we've had patients who did well initially after tracheobronchoplasty, and then two years later came back with a recurrent tracheomalacia. And then we figured out that they actually had um, uncontrollable GERD. This is before we would routinely do pH probes on everyone. I mean, everyone has GERD, right? Everyone takes PPIs nowadays. So, but who really has GERD, and how much GERD do they really have? You, you don't know. So, so from, from that lesson, we, we learned that we really need, need a, we need a Demister score on, on every patient, and we need to do Nissen on patients who have a very high Demister score before they go on for trachea probe. Because you don't want to do a, a major operation on someone who, who um, doesn't have, a, you know, a, controllable risk factors. So that's, that was one learning point. Another learning point was that patients were coming back with recurrent symptoms, but they did not have recurrent tracheomalacia. Their, their bronchoscopy looked okay. And then we learned that they have vocal cord dysfunction. And then we realized that all of the patients need to be thoroughly screened by an experienced laryngologist. And when their vocal cord dysfunction was addressed, half of those patients got better, which leads you to believe that maybe they never required the big operation to begin with. So, you know, these are the things that you, you pick up along the way, and, and we've published on it. And, and uh, you know, the protocol for uh, TBM evaluation is, is, always, is always changing. But, um, but now, now we, we, you know, thoroughly, you know, sleep apnea. Uh, every patient obviously needs a sleep study and, you know, CPAP titration to optimize them. So it becomes a very multidisciplinary and a very complex disorder. But I think at the end of the day, if you can isolate the patients who, who have a functional problem and, 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 and you can prove that fixing the functional problem makes them better, i.e. putting in a stent makes them better, then they go on to have surgery and so far we've had good success. They don't come back with recurrent symptoms. Once you discharge the patient, how frequently do you follow them? So typically uh, for tracheomalacia, uh, these patients, if they were operated on, they would come back about every three to six months initially, and they would have, um, uh, they would have um, uh, a bronchoscopy um, probably about three months down the road. Um, and then for the first year, they probably get followed every three or six months, um, and, and they get frequent bronchoscopies. Um, and, um, and then as time goes on, it's, it's less frequent. You know, again, also the, the um, you know, even though bronchoscopy is the, is the gold standard, um, you know, a CT uh, for tracheobronchomalacia um, is, is obviously something that, that um, you, you know, it's an attractive uh, screening tool. Uh, you, you can't bronchoscope everyone. But the problem is that even in my, I'll be honest, even in my institution, when I came to Cornell a year and a half ago and I, and I worked on a protocol with my radiologist, and he's a great radiologist, and still I, I do not trust our own um, 
uh, you know, dynamic CT scans to make a diagnosis or rule out a diagnosis. I mean, if they make a diagnosis, great, but, but as a negative predictive value, I don't trust it. And I still bronchoscope those patients if I suspect it. And sure enough, I've had um, positive bronchoscopies with a, with, a, with a normal CT scan. And again, it just, just goes to show you that it really, you know, you really need a very experienced, dedicated radiologist and a technician and, you know, as an institution. So uh, when the guys in Boston published their, their findings at Bethesda Deaconess, um, you know, and they've been doing this for over 10 years, and they are probably the biggest referral center for tracheal bronchomalacia in America. You know, in their hands, uh, the, the negative and the positive predictive values for, for CT scan is upwards of 90%. I can guarantee you that is not the case in, in, in other hospitals. So, so you just have to take that into consideration. How does it look? Uh, the bronchus, is it just redundant tissue, or is it all just No. After the, after the, no, 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 before. Before, before. oh, I got you. Before TBM, before the tracheoplasty, looks like this. So th there is different. There's different. Um, there's different types of tracheo tracheomalacia. There's concentric tracheomalacia. So um, what you're describing, the, the redundant tissue, um, is one of the uh, component. Could be one of the things. Um, there's also a term called excessive dynamic airway collapse. EDAC. Excessive dynamic airway collapse, and basically what that means is that your posterior membrane bulges in, but your anterior membrane, your anterior rings are fine, right? As opposed to a problem where the anterior cartilage itself um, has has weakening of the of the of the cartilaginous supporting structures, and and so, for example, uh, you can have in um, as you guys know, saber sheath trachea, right? And COPD um, is a is an issue where the the cartilage itself. Has a, has a sort of an A-type configuration. So I think from a practical standpoint, from a clinical standpoint, differentiating excessive dynamic airway collapse from, from a true tracheomalacia where the anterior cartilage is collapsing is not very important because you still treat it the same way and, and um, uh, and if you're, you know, if you're dealing with one of these uh, um, uh, connective tissue diseases, uh, relapsing polychondritis, Wagner's, uh, you know, one of those conditions, you probably will see an issue with, with the uh, interior tracheal wall as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what I'll do is um, actually, actually, I can drop this off. Uh, sure. Maybe drop her off, and it, this just highlights some of the um, some of the um, um, some of these procedures. Kind of, you know, some of the slides we already talked about. There's a few things on here that that I didn't discuss just for sake of time, but if you are feel free to to peruse at your leisure. Thanks very much. All right. All right. The Thanks so much. Nice to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. Pretty cool, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I heard I went to medical school with my 